Hi, um, my name is Jim Haber. I'm professor of biology at Brandeis University. Uh, I have been talking about how cells repair broken chromosomes, and I want to talk specifically now about how uh, the repair of broken chromosomes is actually fraught with uh, mutagenic danger. It turns out that although uh, repair of breaks uh, by using homologous recombination is far more conservative than non-homologous end joining that would just join random segments of DNA together in translocations that you see frequently in tumor cells. It's, it turns out not to be as accurate as normal DNA replication. And understanding that has led to a, a great deal of understanding of exactly how uh, repair is taking place uh, at all. Okay, so uh, the normal process of DNA repair that I've talked about uh, in the previous videos um, is illustrated on, on, on the left side of this uh, screen. A, a double-strand break is made. The ends of the double-strand break are resected by exonucleases. A RAD51 recombination protein is recruited. And then a search for homology takes place where base pairing is finally accomplished between uh, the invading uh, recipient DNA and the donor. And that base pairing is facilitates then the recruitment of a new DNA uh, polymerase, and the polymerase starts to copy this uh, uh, template in order to patch up the, the double-strand break. But this repair process is different from normal DNA replication in that the newly synthesized DNA is being unwound as it's being synthesized, much in the way that RNA is unwound from DNA during transcription. And the consequence of that is that this uh, strand sometimes can be completely liberated. In fact, it often is liberated so that it will pair up with the other end of the double-strand break. That makes for an efficient repair event where just a patch of new DNA synthesis has uh, taken place. But it's a dangerous point, because at the point where this has been liberated from its template, it's possible that this uh, broken segment of DNA will go somewhere else and participate in an illegitimate uh, uh, recombination event, leading to some hybrid or mutagenic outcome that was not part of the original uh, uh, repair process. And I'm going to talk about events that basically hijack um, the system to, to lead to certain kinds of uh, uh, errors in DNA repair. Okay, to learn about this in some detail, we used the mating type switching system that I have previously described. Uh, this is a system in which a site-specific double-strand break made by a nuclease called HO, uh, analogous to the way Cas9 uh, enzymes make double-strand breaks, uh, that it will cut one place in the genome and uh, then use a template to repair that uh, break. In this case, the template uh, is, is a sequence called HMR, and the sequences that are normally inside HMR that would be used uh, in mating type switching have been removed and replaced by a copy of a uracil-3 gene that comes from an, a different yeast called Cloveromyces lactis. And these sequences, although they're intact, are not expressed because the donor in this situation is kept in a silent heterochromatic form um, which is the normal donor state uh, of the HMR locus in, in, in Saccharomyces. So even though these sequences could be expressed, they're not expressed, and the cells, as a consequence, are uracil minus. If we turn on the HO endonuclease, then these sequences are used and copied as the template sequences to, to go into the MAT locus. And now these sequences are expressed because they're Euro plus and there is, they're no longer heterochromatic. So the cells uh, can be easily seen to go from Euro minus to Euro plus. They've successfully done this mating type switch or this analogous uh, switching process. But that means we could select for mutations. And it's very easy to select for uracil minus mutations because they become resistant to a drug called 5-fluoroerotic acid. And so we could select for Euro minus outcomes that would be uh, the result of some event, switching event uh, that had a mutation. So we found a lot of these. And, and uh, a reviewer came along and said, but how do you know that these mutations didn't arise already in the silent copy? Maybe heterochromatic uh, experience for the uracil 3 gene would lead to a high level of mutation. And we could show that wasn't the case, because if we inhibit this 
silencing. And you can do that by adding a drug called nicotinamide, which inhibits the SIR2 histone deacetylase. We would unsilence this locus to become uro uh, expressed, and these uro minus cells became uro plus, because this copy is mutant arising during the repair process, but the donor template is still intact and is Euro plus. So all the mutations that we are looking at arose during recombination. So we sequenced a lot of these. Um, not surprisingly, a significant fraction, more than half of the mutations were base pair substitutions. Here they're illustrated above uh, the DNA sequence line, and they are um, uh, single base pair changes. Uh, the ones in black represent chain terminating or nonsense mutations that, that stop the translation. Um, but there are lots of uh, base pair substitutions. But then there were a lot of other mutations that were, uh, that were quite different. Um, the, uh, one very simple one is just that there are two copies of a sequence in a row, ATC, ATC, and this becomes a deletion of three bases. Somehow the polymerase is ignored or stepped over one copy of this uh, triplet. But there were a lot of these kinds of frame shift uh, mutations. Uh, about 30 percent of all the events were minus one frame shifts. Um, and that's interesting, uh, first of all, because they all occurred in very specific contexts. They weren't just random losses of one nucleotide. Almost all of these uh, uh, mutations occurred in homonucleotide runs. For example, here are three Gs that become two Gs, and here uh, there are four Cs that become three Cs. So what was happening frequently is that the polymerase was copying in a, in a homonucleotide uh, run and just simply dropping out a base. It's interesting also there are no plus ones. And it turns out that this family of polymerases, and it turns out it's DNA polymerase delta, as I'll show you, that's doing all of this. This family of polymerases very frequently will step over a base making a minus one mutation, but it doesn't make plus one mutations. But there were other far weirder events than, than what I've just described. And the two that I'm going to focus on are, are the ones in the red boxes, which are called quasi-palindrome mutations, and these long red lines that I will talk about uh, some more. The quasi-palindrome mutations uh, are a reflection of the, what I told you at the beginning, which is that the newly synthesizing DNA is going to fall off from its template. And here, when it falls off from its template, it's capable of pace pairing with itself. Uh, obviously, these are so-called quasi-palindrome mutations because they're not entirely perfect, as, as is illustrated here. But if this folding over happens and then, then you copy uh, the newly synthesized strain, you are effectively perfecting the palindrome and in the course introducing complex mutations. And we found a number of these quasi-palindrome mutations as a reflection of the fact that the DNA polymerase that is copying the, the template is falling off, pairing with itself, and then eventually getting back to doing its finishing the job uh, so that we could recover these events. So quasi-palindromes are yet another reflection of the instability of this uh, copying process. And then there were the very weird events where it turns out that a significant fraction of the sequence didn't come from the original template. And it turns out that it came from another copy of uracil-3 on a different chromosome. So as I said at the beginning, we were using a copy of uracil-3 that did not come from cerevisiae but comes from Cloverhomyces. It turns out to be 72 percent identical to the uracil-3 copy that Saccharomyces has, which is, first of all, located on a different chromosome and was not expressed because it is interrupted by a transposable element. And in a sense, we were lazy because we didn't get rid of these sequences. We didn't think anything would really happen. And because we were lazy, we were a bit lucky, because otherwise we probably never would have seen these inter-chromosomal template switches, which is what is going to happen in these cases. So what's happening here is that, again, the newly synthesized strand is dissociating from its template. But here it is somehow going to a completely different chromosome, interacting with sequences that it is only 72 percent identical, copying some of that information. And then in order to be complete and then for us to recover the events, it has to actually jump back. So it requires two jumps. 
in order to be able to do this, in each one of them involving only a 72% identical sequence uh, between these two templates. So we call these interchromosomal template switches, and they turned out to be um, surprisingly frequent. Okay. It turns out that all of these errors that I just described are the consequence not of some special DNA polymerase. Yeast cells, like mammalian cells, have a number of so-called translesion or bypass polymerases, which it uses in, in situations such as uh, confronting uh, of, uh, photodimers in, that are generated by UV and in other circumstances. But these are not the polymerases that are generating these mistakes. The, the polymerase that's generating these mistakes is DNA polymerase delta itself. And we found this out by taking advantage of a proofreading defective mutant, which, which I'll describe in just a moment uh, as to what that does to DNA polymerase delta. But in the absence of this proofreading activity, what we found were many more base pair substitutions. But all those things below the line, the minus one frame shifts, the quasi-palindromes, and the interchromosomal templates, which is, are virtually gone. So it is the polymerase delta, the normal replicative polymerase, which is, in fact, the agent of most of these mutational events. Okay, so I have to say a little bit about how polymerase delta really works. It turns out that polymerase delta actually is, does, has two importantly different conformations. Every time it adds a base, it then rearranges itself to check whether the base it added is correct. And it will do that, um, and, and if it finds that the base is incorrect, if that base is not properly paired, an exonuclease activity of the polymerase will then chew it away. It'll go back to the uh, original conformation and resynthesize the base. So every step in DNA replication has the potential to go back and forth between these two conformational states. If we delete the proofreading activity of this enzyme, it stays, we think, locked in one of these two conformations. And we think that, that this, uh, this conformation is more processive and doesn't fall off the DNA the way that we see in the wild-type enzyme. And as a consequence, it doesn't make frame shift mutations, and it doesn't make quasi-palindrome mutations, but it makes many, many more base pair substitutions because it doesn't have a proofreading domain anymore. And the beautiful experiment done by Peter Burgers and Dmitry Gordinian, which illustrates this, is shown here. So here's a template. Uh, it has a priming uh, oligonucleotide to which the polymerase can bind. And once the polymerase binds, it starts synthesizing DNA down the DNA. But when it hits this blocking oligonucleotide, which is here, the replication stops. So we get this one very clear um, uh, block in the synthesis. The proofreading defective mutation just keeps on going, goes all the way to the end of the template, which means it somehow can displace the blocking oligonucleotide. And I think that's a very uh, clear indication that the reason that we don't see um, quasi-palindrome mutations or frame shifts or interchromosomal switches is simply that this mutated enzyme stays on its original template and doesn't dissociate in the same way that we see uh, in, in these mutagenic events. Okay, so we've studied these events in a little bit more detail. Olga Sapanino, who was a postdoc in my lab, uh, created a, a, a 32 base pair deletion inside the donor locus. So if this template is used in a mating type switching event, which happens most of the time, um, it produces a uracil minus cell because the 32 base pair deletion isn't corrected. And the only way to get a ura plus cell out of this arrangement is to do this interchromosomal switch and create a chimeric protein which is partly Cloveromyces and partly Saccharomyces, um, where the 32 base pair uh, mutation has been uh, corrected by copying from the 72% identical um, sequence. Um, one thing that Olga learned by doing these experiments was to answer a question that, that had we'd been wondering about for some time. We wondered whether the frequent uh, events that we were seeing where the polymerase fell off the DNA, as, if you will, was because the donor locus was, a, was held in this very highly heterochromatic 
uh, state where it uses very highly positioned nucleosomes across this region to prevent its transcription. And we wondered whether polymerase banging into these highly positioned nucleosomes was the reason that, the, that the, we were seeing such a high level of these mutational events. But that turns out not to be the case, because here we could unsilence the locus using a mutation that prevents the silencing and the well positioning of these nucleosomes, and the result was that the, the frequency didn't change. So so it isn't that the polymerase is being displaced by the highly positioned nucleosomes. It's an intrinsic instability of the polymerase itself. OK, so these sequences are only 72% identical. And the question is, when the jumps happen, where do they go in and where do they come out? And so we measured these questions in, in, in some uh, detail. Um, the amount of DNA that's being copied uh, turns out to be about, uh, on average, 250 to 300 bases from the, from the second template, but it's not, it doesn't start at the same place and it doesn't always stop at the same place. It's, it's pretty well normally distributed. And if we look more carefully at these events um, as to where the strand invasion goes into uh, the second copy on the other chromosome, you can see that it, it, it goes into many different places. And if you choose one of those places where it goes in to the template, then the question is, how does it come out on the other side of the 32 base pair deletion in order to do the correction? And the answer is, it comes out all over the place. So there's no preferential place where it starts, and there's no preferential place where it ends. And, and that raises a question as to what exactly is being recognized by this polymerase. And so one thing that we, we wanted to know is, well, that's the, we, we had been studying these with only 72% identical sequences. What would happen if we made them identical? And what we discovered is that the rate goes up 10,000-fold. And now, three out of 1,000 of the, of the switching events that we recover have actually done this interchromosomal switch. And what that means to me is that, uh, that this polymerase is very frequently falling off the DNA. Now we have facilitated it finding a partner because the template is 100% identical, and then it will go back, and again, the template is 100% identical. And under these circumstances, we see this very high rate of these events, which I think means that the repair polymerase is dissociating very, very frequently from its template. So let me just say one more thing about these microhomologies. So whenever it goes in or out, uh, we could define exactly where it goes in and out by the matches between the sequences that it was copying and the sequences where it continued. And, and, some of, and so these define what are called regions of microhomology between the divergent sequences that are being used in the repair event. And some of these sequences are being used very, very frequently but other sequences, which are almost as long, um, are being used very infrequently. And we don't yet understand the rules as to exactly what sequences are being used uh, to go in or out of these sequences. Um, but, but we think it's a fundamentally important question is to understand exactly uh, how microhomology is being used in this repair event. And one of the reasons that I think it's very important to understand microhomology-mediated events um, is a phenomenon uh, in human cells called chromothripsis. So uh, I, uh, if you've seen karyotypes of, of tumor cells, you can, you can stain chromosomes and see um, where different segments of DNA came from. But the surprising thing is that in some cases, there's no obvious rearrangement of the chromosomal material because everything comes from one chromosome. But this phenomenon called chromothripsis was discovered by Peter Campbell's lab only in 2011. It seems astonishing that something as fundamental as this could be not known, but it could not be known until DNA sequencing was sufficiently robust to be able to really see these kinds of events. And what what Campbell's lab first described was uh, chromothripsis, which means chromosome shattering. And what was happening was that one chromosome was being broken apart into dozens, if not hundreds, of pieces and rearranged, but all within the same chromosome. And, and uh, this, of course, 
uh, could cause translocations, deletions, all sorts of crazy events um, that, that we did not appreciate happened at all. And the, the bottom part of this just illustrates this with one chromosome. This happens to be the one uh, highly, highly rearranged chromosome in the, in the chromosomes of Henrietta Lacks, the, the, the uh, woman whose HeLa cells have been used in probably 100,000 uh, publications. Um, and it turns out that Lacks's chromosome 11, one copy of her chromosome 11, shows examples of this incredible rearrangement of chromothripsis. So what we would like to know is how do these events occur? One easy way to explain these events is that they're just being joined together by uh, taking all the shattered pieces and putting them back together by non-homologous end joining. But another possibility, which has been suggested uh, by uh, Phil Hastings uh, and, and Jim Lupsky and also by uh, uh, Gilles Fischer and, and uh, 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 Bernard Dujon, is that there is something called microhomology mediated template switching. And the idea of these events is that that it is the repair DNA polymerase which starts to copy some region and then jump sometimes a megabase away or even further uh, to another place, picking up some sequence and then going to another place and going to another place and stitching together a rearranged chromosome, which again has very small junctions, microhomology junctions, but is a replicatively dependent process. And we think, in fact, that the DNA repair events that we're looking at fall into this category. I think that understanding microhomology mediated template switching is a fundamentally important question. And the yeast system that I've described uh, provides insights into what is really happening uh, during these template switching events. I've spent a lot of time talking about the individual steps in, in DNA repair. We've done this mostly in uh, the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, a, a simple unicellular organism, but the principles of repair that we have learned about turn out to be shared by all eukaryotic organisms. There are differences in details. Mammalian cells have uh, some different proteins from what yeast has, but the fundamental processes are, are really remarkably conserved. And it, it becomes even more important to understand some of these uh, steps in detail because uh, all of the new gene editing techniques using site-specific nucleases, uh, Cas9 in particular, um, also rely basically on these very similar kinds of repair mechanisms. So understanding them and the dangers of associated mutations associated with these processes um, will turn out to be a very important uh, thing to follow up. Thanks very much.